Welcome back to the Vanillin from scratch series. In this episode, we're continuing our journey by converting the paratoluene sulfonic acid we made last time into what is called paracrystal. This transformation involves a pretty intense reaction using molten sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. These molten bases are extremely corrosive, so much that they can dissolve glass, which is very impressive. Anyway, let's start with the first step. To make the paracrystal, we first need to neutralize our paratoluene sulfonic acid to transform it into its sodium salt. Here I will use sodium carbonate because you can see the reaction happening clearly with the evolution of CO2 gas. That being said, you could also use other bases like sodium hydroxide or bicarbonate as long as you use the correct amount, you know. I first weighed the crude paratoluene sulfonic acid we made in the last video. It goes on to be 70 grams, though in reality it's less because it's still a little wet probably. Then I add some water until the 200 ml mark. The solution is very dark, indicating lots of impurities, but it's actually fine because they seem to disappear somehow later. Then I made a solution of 22 grams of sodium carbonate in a 100 ml beaker by stirring it on the hot plate. When it has finished dissolving, I add it to the paratoluene and sulfonic acid in small increments. To measure the reaction, you can get a rough estimate using, you know, the amount of bubbling you see and then you just do some final adjustments until you get the pH close to neutral, which is between yellow and green on those shitty litmus papers. When all the carbonate has been added, we can start to heat to boil off the excess water. Alright, so in the end we are left with this very nice fluffy powder. It's not completely dry, so I'm gonna let it on the hot plate. Okay, now that we have our sodium paratoluene sulfonate, we can actually start to make the paracrystal. To do so, we will follow this procedure from the organic synthesis website. I first measure 40 grams of potassium hydroxide in the beaker, and then 100 grams of sodium hydroxide. If you are wondering why we don't just use sodium hydroxide, even though it's cheaper, let me explain. The main reason is that if you only use sodium hydroxide, the reaction will straight up not work, because the sodium paratoluene sulfonate won't dissolve at all in it. So you need at the very least 23% potassium hydroxide according to the paper. I, I don't really know why in, in details, it's a bit complicated I suppose, but whatever. Anyway, I added all of the hydroxide to this iron can and started heating to the maximum. The idea is to first melt them together before starting the reaction. On the meantime, I measure the sodium paratoluene sulfonate. The paper says you need a first portion of 15 grams and then another one of 45, so 16 total. I just don't understand why in the paper they just don't combine them because it wouldn't change anything because you add them one after the other, so it's the same thing. I don't know. When the hydroxide mixture is melted together, you either need to cool it down or heat it until it is at 230 degrees. Then you can start the additions. So you add the 15 grams and then the rest and basically you just add it in portion uh, when the mix is thin enough to stir. And then just stir the fuck out of it until it gets somewhat homogeneous. It forms a sort of paste that gets um, pastier, you know, when you add some solid, but it gets thinner over time when heating. After the additions are finished and with enough heat, the mixture should form a sort of weird dense foam on the top at about 300 degrees. This is not the end point yet though and you need to heat it even more until about 330 degrees but you don't really have to check the temperature actually because um, the sort of dense foam will suddenly disappear and some gas bubble will start to form and at this point the mix is entirely black which is also expected even with pure reagent it's normal and then you can stop. So now I took it off the heat to cool down and solidify. I also recommend you actively stir when it's cooling down, otherwise it will form a solid block which is much more annoying to deal with. Alright, so now we're gonna measure approximately 650 millimeters, I believe. Between 600 and 700 is fine. Okay. 
All right, so here we have the finely solidified product. As you can see, it's kind of kind of yellow brown. It's a little bit of a weird color. It's still it's still kind of hot, so I'm not gonna touch it for too long. And now we're gonna dissolve it basically in the water. Hmm, that's what I thought. It's very exothermic. Our product, the pyrocrystal, at the moment is in the form of a salt, so to extract it we first need to make the solution at least neutral or perhaps a little bit acidic even. To do so, I'm just gonna add some 37 sulfuric acid and this should precipitate out our pyrocrystal. The thing is, because the solution is hot, it's probably going to separate as a liquid instead because it's just gonna melt before even forming. Anyway, this reaction is very exothermic and also produces sulfur dioxide so make sure to not breathe in it directly. We can continue adding the acid until the solution stops generating sulfur dioxide or when the pH gets acidic. And as you can see, it is now strongly acidic, which is great, this is what we want. When that's done, I put a whole liter of solution into this round bottom flask to extract the paracrystal. This is a distillation setup and it allows us to boil the solution and get back whatever boils. Here it's gonna be a huge amount of water plus a little bit of a product that's gonna get carried over by the water. And to make sure to get all of the paracrystal, I need to collect about 600 to 700 milliliters of distillate, which took quite a few hours actually. <laughs> the distillate is pretty easy to distinguish from normal water, because the paracrystal is not very soluble in it and it makes it look cloudy, you know. This way you can tell when all the paracrystal has been distilled, because the distillate will no longer look cloudy. Here you can already see at the bottom the dark hole which is a paracrystal, but to get more out of the water I'm gonna add some salt to saturate the water with it. Basically, the paracrystal is mostly non-polar but still a little bit due to the phenol group. Because of this it can dissolve a tiny bit in the water. The salt on the other hand is very very polar, even more than water. So those two like to be together more than the paracrystal which is gonna drop out of the water. At least that's the theory. I stirred the solution until a maximum amount of salt was dissolved and then I poured part of the solution into a separation funnel. Like the name indicates, it makes it easier to separate two liquid phases like we have here. I will also use some toluene as a solvent to try to extract even more paracrystal. Now we have those two solutions containing mostly toluene and a paracrystal, but as you can see they look very cloudy which is a clear indication that they contain water. To remove it I'm gonna add what's called an hydrous calcium chloride. It's a sort of salt that loves water, so it will absorb it and make a solution clear. Alright, so as you can see now they look absolutely beautiful. I've just been stirring for like what, 2 minutes, something like this? It has been very fast, especially when you stir. If you don't stir, it might take like, I don't know, an hour perhaps. When that was done, I filtered the calcium chloride and put all of the toluene paracrystal solution in a beaker in order to boil down the toluene to be left with only your paracrystal. Alright, anyway, now we're just gonna put this to boil in order to boil the toluene off. Nice. In the end, we are left with about 20 milliliters, which I guess is an okay yield. I just want to show you that it's a solid crystalline form. To do so, it's pretty easy, we just need to chill it in an ice bath for a few minutes. 
When it's done, it makes those beautiful concentric needles and this whole thing weighs about 16 grams, which is well enough to continue. On another topic, I'm currently having a few problems with the next step, so the video might have a few days of delay, I'm sorry for that, but I'm working very hard on it. I've made though some good cobalt chloride from the batteries, so that's great. And the only thing to get right now is the extraction of the parahydroxybenzaldehyde, which is very tricky because I failed twice already. But not really, because at the time of writing the script of this video, I'm already making some more paracrystal to try again. Anyway, that was all for today. Tell me if you want a video on the cobalt chloride extraction, and in the meantime, why don't you watch one of those videos, perhaps?